Hello, is this thing on? Do you think they can hear us? Nah, let's say it again. Hi, and welcome to the Gritty Nurse Podcast, an unfiltered discussion related to health and healthcare. My name is Amy. And my name is Sarah. And we are your podcast hosts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, or any other podcast listening platform, don't forget to subscribe so you can get updates to when we have our latest episodes. Also, don't forget to rate and review us. And if you like what you're hearing and you love our advocacy work, don't forget to go to www.grittynurse.com and click on the donate button. As little as $1 or $2 a month for a total of $12 a year will help us with our monthly podcast costs such as website hosting, our hosting platform, audio equipment, and the time and energy it takes us to put out good quality episodes. We thank you and we appreciate you. Hi again, welcome to the Greedy Nurse Podcast. I am super stoked. I'm excited for this guest that we have. I am, I have to say, I'm three days post-op, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good right now. <laughs> and I've taken my pain meds. I've behaved myself. Earlier today, I didn't, but maybe we'll get into that later. But Sarah, can you introduce our guest for today? Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Alika Lafontaine. He is an award-winning physician who practices anesthesia in Grand Prairie, Alberta, and a physician of Cree, Anishinaabe, Métis, and Pacific Islander heritage, born and raised in Southern Saskatchewan Treaty 4 territory. Dr. Lafontaine holds leadership positions with many organizations, including Alberta Health Services, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada. In 2021, he was also listed on the Medical Post Doctors with Sway, a list of the top 30 most influential physicians in Canada based on peer feedback. The Canadian Medical Association members in Alberta have voted Dr. Alika Fontaine as president-elect starting in fall 2021. We're so glad to have you today, Dr. Lafontaine. Um, I just thought maybe we could start by you telling us a little bit about your background and why you chose to go into anesthesia. Sure. So I was born and raised in Southern Saskatchewan, like you said, Treaty 4 territory. Uh, my family, like many you know, Indigenous, Black, or Person of Colors families, um, didn't have a lot of medical persons in it. And mine in particular didn't have anyone. And so entering into medicine was something that was really put into my head by my mom early on in my life. And it was something that she suggested to all of us, you know, uh, looking around at, you know, the five of us, uh, boys and girls, there was four of us boys and, and uh, you know, one, one sister. She asked each of us, you know, as you think of what you want to become, think of how what you become can give back to the family. And I know one of the big fears that she had early on was, you know, the risk of racism and discrimination within the healthcare system. And I know that she had had some experiences herself before starting a family. And I know some of her experiences up to the point that she talked to us uh, had helped to color some of that request. And, you know, since then, I know that she's gone through similar experiences. And so me choosing to become a doctor really circled back to that desire to follow through on, you know, that ask from my mom, you know, make sure that somebody is there in the system to help in case something happens. That's, that's hugely important. And I think I like, I don't have any, if I even think about my own family, like we don't have any first generation physicians either in our family. And um, I mean, I think that it's so important to, to have that representation and that modeling, that role modeling. Like, I think that, you know, your mom said to you, you could be anything and, and you became a physician. So I think that's, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think any of us who end up going into just health professions in general, whether, you know, you're, you're non-Indigenous or Indigenous or whatever your background is, uh, we all kind of have driving forces. But I, I have found that those who've come from backgrounds that could be more racialized than others, um, a lot of the reason why we go in is because we're, we're worried about our family members. Right. You know, we, we see different things happening and 
you know, whether you become a physician or a nurse or a pharmacist or whomever, I think just having someone who can help you process those experiences really adds a lot to you being able to navigate the system and, you know, get better care. So I'm not surprised that that you guys have some of the same things going through your heads when you look at the reasons why you went into what you went mm-hmm. into. Absolutely. So so why anesthesia? You know, I, I remember when I first uh, applied for medical school, you know, you, you got that one question, why do you want to become a doctor, right? And I remember sitting down and trying to think through that question before the interviews. And, you know, it, it was it's a different experience being a health professional where you get this person, you've never met them before, and they start to tell you about, you know, their bowel movements, right? <laughs> like what, what kind of job <laughs> you get somebody who, you know, <laughs> you meet for the first time. And like they go into such detail and they really look across to you and they're like, you know, you're going to help me get through this. Right. You know, I have this problem and you're going to help me. And I think when I looked at the different specialties I could go into, um, I really thought through what what would bring that kind of relationships of trust, that relationship of, you know, being able to help. And interestingly, that actually took me down the path of neurosurgery. I, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon um, ever since I had gotten into med school. And I ended up meeting my my future wife. And I remember kind of halfway through med school, late in med school, uh, she told me, you know, if you're going to go into a surgical specialty, uh, this is kind of the end of the road for us. You know, she she had had some experiences where she had close friendships that, you know, had fallen to the wayside because of, you know, how demanding, you know, surgical specialty was, especially, you know, at that time, all those years ago. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what to do after that because it, it was pretty much, you know, choose me or choose she was being a neurosurgeon and I of course chose her. And I remember feeling really lost in that third year of med school, uh, leading into doing rotations and other things. And I, I had a close friend who, uh, you know, encouraged me to shadow him. And I, I went on call with him one night uh, after, you know, checking out a lot of other specialties because I didn't know a lot about anesthesia at the time. Right. And I remember walking into an emergency had been called on the floor and it was a scene of, you know, just chaos. Like the patient had, you know, vomited onto their chest and the IVs had pulled out and people were just trying to scramble to, you know, get some sense of control. And, you know, this friend of mine walked in and, you know, within a few minutes, a a very chaotic scene had, you know, come under control, you know, IV access, you know, the other things that you do when, you know, you get called up to an emergency and, I remember sitting there watching him, just thinking to myself, that's really what I want to be able to do. You know, go into a situation that feels out of control and know what to do and be able to help support, you know, the people who are there doing their jobs. Um, and I think that's one of the things I really love about anesthesia. You know, like we're we're not often seen as the leaders in day-to-day work, but when there's an emergency, we know exactly what to do. And, right. you know, we, we end up really being that first follower a lot of times. Where, you know, you, you have a designated leader like the surgeon or, you know, the person who's running the code mm-hmm. or you're working with, you know, an ICU team of nurses when you kind of walk in and you're really there to support people to make better decisions and really help people to feel like they're in control in situations that otherwise would seem really chaotic. So and that's that's a part of my specialty I really, really love. That's really great to hear. I mean, like the way that you describe just calming that whole room down. I think that is a very important part of anesthesia. And when people think of medicine, you know, from all cultures, they're always thinking about how can my pain be managed or what do I do if my pain's out of control? So I think that's a really great way that you sort of brought it back. Yeah. And I mean, I have a lot of respect for anesthesiologists, honestly. Like, I mean, if there are three disciplines that I have a lot of respect for, it's anesthesia, emergency med, and of course, obstetricians, because that was also mm-hmm. my background. But I mean, I think I think that I learned a lot from actually, uh, she's probably a colleague of yours too, uh, Dr. Saru Sharda. And mm-hmm. um, there was a lot of stuff that she even taught me that I didn't even know about, like, because, you know, you're a nurse, you're like, I, 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 I totally get this thing about epidurals and stuff. And she's like, let me talk about the most scary part in terms of anesthesia, which is extubation. I was like, really? And just, <laughs> it was just like, so like so much that I learned from her. And I was just like, yeah, this is such an interesting profession, but also you must see some really, really horrible things too, right? 
Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting watching the culture of medicine change over the last decade. And I, I hope you guys are seeing changes in the places that you practice too, but mm. there's more of a general appreciation of what people do. Mm. And I, I think anesthesia, because we depend so much on, you know, the nurses that we work with to kind of know their role and play their role. And same with the surgeons and everyone else who works within the OR and other places in the hospital that, you know, there, there's a different type of dependability or right. synergy, I guess, you know, like we, we really realize from our role that, you know, we, we don't, we never stand alone. Like anesthesia is always there to support or be supported. Right. Right. right? And it, it's nice to come to work and really feel like there's a culture of respect between you and the people that you work with. Right. You know, and that's, I, I really like how that's getting better and better as we kind of move forward with some of the changes you've seen in the last few years. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I remember as a labor and delivery nurse, there were some anesthesiologists we were just like, yes, this person's on call. It's going to be so great. And then there were some that we were absolutely terrified of. Like, I remember there was this one <laughs> anesthesiologist, he'd come in, he's like, why, why is she not in the position? And we're like, oh my gosh, like, hurry up, get her, get her sitting at the end of the bed. And, and he was just so grouchy. And we're just like, but you're mm-hmm. only going to be here for 15 minutes. But like, I think, I think mm-hmm. you're right. The, the culture is changing. And I've seen it change too within, within my own practice that I have to be honest, every anesthesiologist I've ever met so far, I've completely enjoyed their company. And I have to just interject here that anesthesiologists are for nurses, the end of the line, if they can't start an IV on someone, we would be like, okay, you know, the, the, the assigned nurse is going to do it. The charge nurse is going to do it. The most experienced nurse is going to do it. Okay. Now let's call anesthesia. And then they would come in and like find this tiny little crooked vein and somehow get the IV in, in the weirdest angle. And we're like, thank God. And we're like, bowing down to them <laughs> yeah they like close their eyes throw the needle and it's in we're like what they're like we don't yeah. know what the problem was you guys and then they just walk away <laughs> you know sometimes it's better to be lucky than good right mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. <laughs> <That too? laughs> so i was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your new position coming up as the president of the canadian medical association do you have any specific goals in mind or things that you'd like to achieve as part of that position so running for the Canadian Medical Association president-elect, and there's there's kind of three phases to the Canadian Medical Association presidencies. Um, there's your president-elect year, and then you become president, and then your past president. And all through those three years, you help and support the other two physicians who are from other parts of the country, but fulfilling different roles at the time. And, you know, I, I never really thought of running for president-elect um, before this past year. To be honest, uh, I had had a couple of friends who had kind of prodded me along to, you know, explore the possibility. And it really wasn't until COVID hit and, you know, all the things that we know we're living through, right? The, the mm-hmm. stress, the frustration, you know, the fear, the exhaustion. You know, I, I don't know if people understand like just how exhausting it is to even take on and off PPE with every single case and patient that you see whether they're COVID or not, right? right? You know, seeing colleagues go through, you know, just the mechanics of the operations that go on day to day. And then also the other things that are going on, you know, the ebbs and flows of, you know, the different waves, you know, we're all starting in into wave three now. And there's parts of the country that have been hit really, really hard by it. And yeah. seeing, you know, the, the effects that that has had on people's livelihoods, you know, their relationships, you know, their, their mental health, their physical health, uh, was really a drive to make me reflect on, you know, how I could help and the roles that I could play. And then there were other things that went on that were outside of medicine, you know, things like Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. you know, the the Me Too movement and, you know, the, this resetting of what's normal to talk about in medicine, you know, and I, I think all those things really opened up this this idea that I could help with to sh- with shaping the narrative moving forward, you know, creating a, a new kind of path for for medicine as part of, you know, the leadership and, you know, roles that, that people play across the country. And, you know, going going into the campaign, there were three things that I'd heard from colleagues across the country. I know that people really wanted, uh, you know, the CMA to start to address the isms, you know, not just racism, but also sexism and classism and ableism and you know, ageism and and all these other isms and, you know, really eliminate the hostility that often comes along with working in those environments Mm -hmm. and, you know, the oppression and restriction that you get into when you're the victim of one of those, those types of types of isms. 
the the second campaign platform I, I really ran on was focusing on the social contract between you know physicians, but even more broadly, you know, providers and society. Uh, we we focus so much on austerity and cost cutting that I think it's really reductionist. We get to the point where you know if if we're in the hospital, we see providers as people, and you know these people that help, and then you move out of the hospital or outside of you know a health environment and you're just dragging down the system, you cost too much and all these things, you get reduced down to, you know, a fiscal number, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I know that people really want to re-explore, like, what, what is the value? Where's the social position uh, of, you know, providers versus the rest of society, governments, you know, patients, etc. And then the, the third platform that, that I really wanted to, to focus on was related to healthy working environments. And I think that's related to what we're talking more openly about now, which is, you know, burnout, uh, moral injury. There's been this idea over the last five to 10 years that somehow if we change ourselves, you know, we, we do yoga more, we go jogging outside, you know, we, we unwind watching Netflix that somehow we'll be able to fix burnout and moral injury mm -hmm. right. when in reality, it's really changing our environments, right? It, it doesn't matter what I do at home. If I come back to work and, you know, that I'm being put in a safe, unsafe position. I see patients being put in unsafe positions. I've been, I'm being overworked. I'm being asked to do more than, you know, I physically am able to do. That creates the environment where, you know, burnout and moral injury and, and some of these really scary consequences really thrives and, and spreads throughout, you know, the medical profession. And I, I don't think any of us are, are immune from it. You know, right. I, I see it going on with nurses. I see it going on with physicians and, you know, every single provider out there. And it's having a really negative effect on patients. And so, you know, really focusing on how to change those working environments is kind of the, the third the third part of the campaign platform that that I really wanted to focus on. And I, I think going into the three years, uh, starting in the fall, there'll be a big opportunity to have those priorities kind of fit under the broader strategy of the CMA and to really look across the country and help CMA members know where they can fit in in amplifying the work of the CMA and the CMA amplifying their work. And there, there's so many amazing things that people are doing out there right now. Um, and so a silver lining of the pandemic, I think, is that, you know, not only have we all become armchair epidemiologists, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we all feel empowered now to, to have a voice. And I, I don't think that that existed before COVID in the same way it does now. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that, in terms of the advocacy, like, like you said, it is that silver lining where people feel empowered to say, Hey, we, we need to do something different. We need to make radical change to make sure that we're seeing better um, patient health outcomes. And also the other platform that you're running on, like understanding that our environments can be toxic. And if we mm -hmm. don't change mm -hmm. the environment, we don't change the culture that we're actually not going to shift the goalposts at all in terms of mental health, stress and burnout within the workplace. So yeah, I, I, do you want to run for, for the, the nursing ones too? <laughs> um, anyhow, I digress. Like, I think what you're doing is amazing. And I think they probably couldn't chose um, a better president elect for this position. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of the work that you're going to be able to do. I, I, I already, I creeped you a little bit and saw that you've already have an internal reporting system for, you know, anti-indigenous racism. I'm like, yes, this is my guy. <laughs> so like, I, mean, so I already know. I already know that, you know, the work that you're going to be doing is going to be so important over the next three years. Oh, thanks so much. But let's talk a little bit about pain. So could you provide mm. us a little bit of a historical context of pain? So I'm, I'm not talking about, um, I'm actually talking about physical pain. <laughs> so, so what do they teach in med school about pain? Are pain scales still really effective tools? Can you give us just that kind of historical overview of your understanding of what pain is? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to diverge away from, you know, the, the, medical physiological explanations of pain because I, I think when you when you look at pain historically especially racialized pain because I, I I think it's really important to to talk about that seeing as there's a lot of research that we've known for a very long time and it illustrates disparities and absolutely you know discrimination and in, in how people get access and other things you know pain pain to me has two parts as an anesthesiologist there's me and what I believe coming into you know, the environment of the patient having pain. 
and there's the patient themselves. And I, I think that as medical students and residents and practicing physicians, we don't do a really good job of helping providers understand their part that they bring to you know, this interaction between provider and patient as we try and figure out what is pain. Right. I think when the visual analogs scale first came in, you know, that scale between zero and 10, where zero mm -hmm. is no pain, 10 is the worst pain that you could imagine, uh, which after surgery probably shifts quite a bit um, <laughs> <laughs> or during labor or, you know, any, any of these other situations where, where you have intense pain. Uh, it, it was a real desire to try and, you know, quantify a subjective experience. Right. Right. Because in, in medicine, I, I think we often make the, the mistake, and this is all historical, that, you know, subjectivity is somehow less valuable as a data point than, you know, objective quantification. Right. right. So, so even the VAS, like that, that's really just us taking a subjective experience and giving a number to it to make ourselves feel better. I think. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going into my 10th year practice and I, I've found over the years, as I look at pain, you can approach pain in a patient context two ways. You can either talk with the patient and think to yourself, you're going to have to prove to me that you have pain before I'm going to do anything about it. Or you can just accept that the lived experience is a lived experience. You know, and, and I think a lot of the mistakes that we've made around pain, particularly around, you know, prescribing, you know, opioids that have helped fuel the uh, opioid crisis, you know, uh, you know, the backlash that happened where suddenly nobody wanted to prescribe anything for pain, which then led to worsening outcomes as far as, you know, quality of life and pain control after surgery, and which I still think that we, we kind of bounce back and forth between those two extremes. Yeah. And then this this future point where, you know, we do a better job of creating an environment where people can share their lived experience of pain and we can really just support them, you know, inform them that, you know, these drugs are addictive, but there's a time and a place and a way to manage them properly. And, you know, these are the guideposts. Let's work together to kind of navigate this complex physiological response you have to stresses in your life right. or things that have happened to you because of surgery, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I, I, I think for patients, describing pain in that way helps to shift, you know, the, the responsibility and accountability for pain between both the provider and the person who's experiencing it. Because right? I, I feel like a lot of times when patients come in for the first time or, you know, for the 12th time right. and they're asking for pain medication, uh, patients often feel very guilty, you know, somehow that the pain is their fault. If they had done something different, they could have avoided the pain. When sometimes pain is just a part of the experience, you know, like right. you, you were talking at the beginning of, you know, our chat about being third day kind of post-op, we know in general that pain tends to peak at around 48 hours after surgery. And so needing escalating, you know, pain relief leading up to that point is actually a reasonable kind of part of the, of the pain arc, you know, after, right. after having surgery. We know that depending on your types of surgeries, some things will be more effective than others. You know, we know non anti-inflammatories are really effective um, in a lot of surgical type pain. Uh, opioids are, are good as an adjunct, maybe not a standalone one. Um, I think Tylenol, it's kind of mixed. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, depending on the person. Um, and so th those three things kind of working together and then the other adjuncts that we can use. Uh, I think describing to patients how how to expect the pain to evolve, and then the different ways that we can intervene helps to really bring them to the point where they can start making informed pain choices. Right. You know, and describing to patients that pain may be a part of it, but it's not necessarily desirable. You know, poorly managed pain lengthens the time for wounds to heal. You know, the, the stress response can lead to other chronic problems. You know, the, the, a common cause for chronic pain is poorly controlled pain over right. a long period of time, you know, and so helping to walk people through, you know, that natural arc of how pain evolves and, you know, pain is experienced and then helping to bring them into our heads, you know, the way that we think about making these different choices and then really making them feel like the pain is not their fault. Right. You know, it's, it's just a part, it's just something you're experiencing. If you have greater pain, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're weaker than the other patient who 
who doesn't have pain, you know, it's, it's partly perception, you know, um, I think all those things can lead to a better experience when it comes to managing pain, especially pain in the post-operative period, which is something I'm, I'm pretty familiar with. Now, if you trace all that back to racialization, mm-hmm. um, I think understanding that there's so much that we bring with us as providers that we project onto patients right. helps us understand, you know, things like large research studies that have shown that in long bone fracture, you know, it's much less likely for a person who's black in a hospital in the U S to receive pain medication than someone who is not black, right? you know, or to have the same sort of thing happen to, you know, indigenous peoples with rheumatoid arthritis, like here in Canada, right? you know, versus someone who's not indigenous. And, uh, you know, it, we have so much wrapped around, you know, the experience of pain and the idea that tolerating pain somehow leads to a, a moral, a, a positive moral connotation. Yeah. You know, you're, you're strong if you resist pain, you know, all these other things. And that, of course, is linked to, you know, what, what we've all inherited through this colonized system of, you know, projecting onto, you know, racialized people, the idea that, you know, they're, they're morally inferior or, you know, inherently they make worse decisions or they're inherently weaker, et cetera. And that, that all just feeds into this downward spiral of not only not interpreting pain properly, but also dealing with it ineffectively, which, which I think is bad for everyone. Right. No, I, I, I completely agree. And like, I can even speak a little bit to my own experience. So like I had, um, I had surgery three days ago and um, so one, yes, I should have definitely stayed on top of those pain meds. But even when I was getting my prescription at the end of the day, like I knew that what was being prescribed to me was adequate, but I still even questioned the provider. And I was just, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's just, if it was the nurse in me or if it was also just the fear to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be getting the most appropriate pain medication that like, even I had my own apprehension when I was leaving to say like, is this, is what she's giving me enough because I remember actually what I they actually offered whether I should have a spinal versus a general so Mm. one I was like I don't know why am I even getting this choice and they're like well you know um because at this point in time the concern with aerosolizing generating procedures it just Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. it's less risky for us to do um, a a general so we could do a spinal so I did, I, I opted for the spinal, but of course there's pros and cons to that too. So I was actually the last person to literally leave the OR for that day. Like my surgery started at 11 and I didn't leave until almost 10 o'clock at night because obviously with the spinal, I had no feeling, I couldn't go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I was just like, <laughs> I can't go. And then I remember them saying to me, they're like, oh, you know what? How about, we'll just like, if you pee, we'll just give you some Tylenol and you can go home. And I'm like, Tylenol? They're just offering me Tylenol? And they're like, no, we've Uh given you some other things. Like you have your naproxen that you'll take. You have oxycodone. And I was just like, oh, like, and then it just kind of put my own back up because I'm like, why are they only offering me Tylenol? And it was it it made me really anxious. And then I had the physician kind of came back down and was like, no, we are giving you oxycodone. We're giving you these things. And then she mentioned addictions. And I was just like, I'm not going to be addicted. I'm taking like four, me- <laughs> four pills. But then but this, it just, it put my back up, right? And it's just like, mm-hmm. how do we have these types of conversations? And, and I mean, she probably didn't know that I was a nurse or anything, but how do we have these conversations with racialized individuals to to not make them feel that they're being treated differently i think there's there's such a margin to move right like there we know that mm-hmm. there's under mm-hmm. treatment of pain so how like how do we manage that like you you kind of talked about how we manage something so subjective but how do we how as racial individuals how do we kind of you know bridge that gap mm-hmm. i i think there's so many different layers and lessons from that story to be honest like from from being asked uh from asking the person who's providing you care, you know, what do I have access to? And like them, them having these different orders out there, but only telling you Tylenol. Right. Right. So, so that's a common experience of racialized individuals where they have a lot of options made available to them by their providers. But at the point of care, the person filters down those options to a single one that they think is appropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe sometimes it's Tylenol, maybe sometimes it's oxycodone, you know, it doesn't necessarily always line up with stronger or weaker or more effective or ineffective kind of treatments, but it's an idea that instead of just giving you all your different options and explaining things in detail, they just kind of give you one, right? 
Right. So that that's kind of one layer to that experience. Another one is, you know, the feeling that you might have had where you kind of question, should I be aggressively controlling this pain? How are people going to treat me? If I yeah. sound like I want pain medication. Right. I was, I was super nervous to ask. Like, I was like, is there something stronger? And I felt even apprehensive, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's totally reasonable because it, it doesn't take much for someone who has a caricature placed onto them mm-hmm. for the people who, you know, are in power and can control those types of decisions or give you access to different types of options to kind of spin and say, oh, you're one of those. Right. You know, and, and it's not just racialized individuals. It's also those who are homeless, those who, you know, have a history of addiction. Like it's not, it's not uncommon for persons who have addictions not to receive any pain medication right. mm-hmm. you know, in the mm-hmm. post-operative period uh, because of the quote unquote risk of addiction. Uh, when in reality, we really should manage your pain. Right. You know? Right. And then, then there's just the workflow stuff surrounding a spinal, you know, one of, one of the things that I've learned over the years is I actually take quite a bit of time explaining to patients that when you have a spinal, when you wake up with no pain, right. And I, I imagine that you might've had sedation or something. And, you know, when, when you were clear headed in recovery room and you felt no pain, that sometimes gives you a warped idea of how things are going to be over the next couple of days. It definitely did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. And so, so I really encourage, and I make sure I encourage in front of the person who provides the options um, to kind of describe to patients, you know, what, what's going to happen in the next few hours. So waiting around till 10, um, that, that's longer than, than I would have expected though, not wholly uncommon, but you know, as, as it started to wear off and, you know, your bladder control came back and the strength in your legs came back and other things, I mean, the pain's going to come rip roaring back as well. It did. Mm-hmm. And, uh-huh. and, and, uh, and, you know, getting, getting that medication to kind of transfer between that stage where you had complete control of your pain with the spinal to the point where you're ready to go home and you have no, no pain control from the spinal anymore. Right. Like that, that's really the zone where you should start taking medication before you even feel pain. Right. Right. And uh, and we know that persons who have the best outcomes are persons who get good pain control from the point that they wake up in recovery room. Right. You know, it's not to say that you're destined to have a, a bad outcome, but we definitely know that people do better if they get good good pain control in the post-operative period as early as possible. And so uh, some of that's education, some of that's understanding behavior, some of that's, you know, just, just bad things that we've modeled as providers on how we you know, provide pain. And, and depending on where you work, those challenges are going to be different. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the patient who has to shoulder the burden of, you know, all the things that we mess up. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. And I, I think this sort of just begs a bigger question as to why do racialized individuals, you know, people who have been identified with addictions um, are treated differently when it comes to pain, because we know that they are. And what are some of the things we can do, in your opinion, to mitigate some of these systemic issues that we know are longstanding and there just seems to, it just seems to happen over and over and over again? You know, one of the things that I really focus on whenever I talk about systemic issues is, you know, really establishing that the system is us, right? So we, we talk about systemic racism, systemic discrimination, you know, systemically poor management of pain. At the end of the day, it's like me, it's you, it's like everybody who's involved in the workflow that is the system. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we sometimes use the word system to distance ourselves from not only responsibility, but, you know, the the other things that come along with that, both good and bad, you know, things like blame, things like empowerment, you know. So I I think that the, the number one thing that I've tried to do in my own practice is really reflect on how I contribute to good and bad experiences when it comes to pain. And I think that that's, that's one thing that's really helped me to reshape my own approaches to patients. You know, there, there's certain things that I really try to normalize. I mean, for example, you know, we, we decriminalize marijuana, right. right? And patients still come in who are heavy marijuana smokers who are very afraid of how are you going to react to them right. if you find out that, that they're heavy marijuana smokers. You know, as, as a provider... I myself don't smoke marijuana, right? Uh, it's not something I encourage, you know, family members to do. Right. But in the same breath, if that manages your pain, I mean, the, the most effective, most powered study is an N of one. Right. So if it works for you and you're doing it in a safe way, who am I as a provider to put you in a position where 
you know, you feel so embarrassed that you're not being open and honest with me about what's going on. So we can, we can make better decisions together. Right. right? And so getting, getting yourself to a point as a provider where you truly try to be non-judgmental and you accept the patient for where they're at and then kind of lead them along. I mean, I never encourage patients to be heavy marijuana smokers or smokers right. or other things, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's an important data point as we try and, you know, map a way forward on how to manage things better. Um, so creating that environment where it feels safe, you can share, you can trust, uh, I think is really, really important. And then bringing patients along to help them to understand how you're making decisions. Because it, right. it, it is interesting how we focus so much on education, when in reality, we could know everything, but still make the same choices that we've always made. Right. Yeah, very and true. And so how... Yeah, how how can data influence better decisions? You know, and and kind of the the third part is, you know, with, with patient centered care when it first came in, I think there was this idea that the patient was the quarterback for their care. <laughs> but you know, if you actually look at the power within hospitals or clinics or any place within medicine, uh, patients can never be their quarterbacks because they don't have authority to do a lot of things. Right. You know. Patients can't order tests. Patients can't prescribe medications. Patients can't, you know, get consent and perform procedures. So this idea that the patient is is the quarterback, um, they only become the quarterback if we cede that power and let them be the quarterback, right? right? And, and I think that that's a really important nuance, especially with pain, that, you know, you as a provider sometimes need to step back and and just let the patient lead you to where you need to go. And sometimes that means making decisions that you maybe wouldn't always make. Of course, we always make safe decisions, right? You know, but there, there's like a there's a band of reasonableness, right? Like you come up and someone's using a little bit more morphine than you'd expect. You know, most times it's probably not a big deal, but in order to really be patient centered, we have to be of the mindset of not what our expectations are, but what's the impact and outcome that the patient's experiencing. Right. Wow. That's that's so powerful to think about it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think even going back to just some of the things that you said, like, so for example, when you kind of mentioned marijuana, like thinking about even mine and Sarah's uh, maternal child experience, like we, I, from my standpoint, I just wanted to know, because <laughs> we want to know if, <laughs> if you've been smoking marijuana, we know we might need a special care nursery. We might need that extra help. It wasn't necessarily anything negative that we were asking. And I think it's also just how the question was framed too, right? Are you using recreational or illicit drugs? It's like, well, you know, <laughs> he just made it legal. So how about we not call it this illicit drug anymore, right? Like, I think mm -hmm. it's also about how we frame things as well. And and this whole idea of patient-centered care, it's always been this thing that I've always tried to wrap my my mind around because whenever I, I was seeing it in action, there's, to me, there was always a power imbalance. There, it was never... It was it was so idealistic and saying, okay, you know, we want to hear from the patient, but at the end of the day, <laughs> that's not how the system kind of set it to work. It was kind of like, well, here's the orders. This is what you're going to do. This is what we're going to do to you instead of with you. And I think it's so important to say, okay, you know what? Maybe I do need to take that sit, that seat back to, you know, you're in the driver's seat. I'm going to make sure that you're steering correctly, but I'm not going to hold the wheel for you. And I think mm -hmm. that is really difficult for a lot of care providers to do because this is, it, but we have to empower people to make really good decisions. Like I can't stress that enough. And the thing is at the end of the day, we have to, it's not that we're happy with the decision that they've made. We know that we've given them all the information and the tools in our tool belt to help equip them to make the right decision, but we can't make that decision for them. And I think that's hugely important. I've seen that so many times where, that paternalism comes out and it's just like, you know, you gotta, there's gotta be a line where you draw and where this person's made that decision. We've got to let it go. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it, it sometimes it's, it's really difficult. It's difficult for nurses. I can, I can only imagine it's probably really difficult for physicians too, but I think we really have to, to know when to take that step back. I think that's hugely important as well. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I, I think there's only one guaranteed thing with any patient interaction, and that's when that patient walks out the door or moves out of that room on the bed or or wheelchair or whatever, they're still going to have to deal with whatever they're going through, and right. we're not. Yep. And so that, that's that's one of the things that, you know, was shared to me early on by, you know, uh, an elder that, that uh, I had 
I had grown to kind of trust and communicate with and stuff. And it's something I, I remember whenever I talk to colleagues or patients or whomever. You know, people make decisions based on logical context to them. Right. Right. And maybe it doesn't make sense to me, but you know, your your role as a provider is try to is to try to understand why it makes sense and then kind of lead them along to have a, a broader context, right? To to know things that they don't know. So maybe they can make different decisions and hopefully the the impacts of, of those decisions are better. You know, and, and I think I think when you talk about things like uh, you know, recreational illicit drugs, like having that question framed that way, there's a lot of different trigger words that you can use to make patients feel like it's a safe space or, or make them understand that it really isn't a safe space. Right. One of the things I always do whenever I ask about marijuana is I always follow up with the comment, you know, we, we just ask everybody nowadays, like just, just normalize. A really good approach. Yeah. 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 And then there's other things which, which are more local. Like I, I realized with Albertans, if I closed off the interview with let's get her done, like <laughs> almost always like 90% of the time. You'll, you'll get a smile and, you know, sometimes you get a thumbs up and the patient suddenly is like, oh, yeah, they, they kind of get me and stuff. So yeah. th- there's all these local things that we that you can pick up if you pay attention to just make patients feel more at ease. No, I, I was going to say that is such an Albertan thing to say because actually I, <laughs> I lived in uh, Cochrane, Alberta for a little period of time there. And yes, I actually remember the physician that I was under care. They used to say, get her done too. It was just, it, it, it's just a, it's just an Albert <laughs> thing. So that, that's kind of amazing. I, th- I think, and that, that's that extra little touch, right? That, that just shows that, you know, you, you're, 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 part, you understand the, the, how, how do, how would I say it? It's just that they understand that, you know, yes, you're the physician, but you're also going to be working for the patient, working with the patient, right? It just shows that human side. And I think sometimes people lose that when, when they're talking to their, their providers and they're just like, you know, they're this, they're this hierarchical figure. And, and it just, it just helps bring that, that, that trust and that level of, of camaraderie together. So I I like that. I think that's Mm -hmm. pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. One thing I would add also is, you know, giving patients the time to express Mm -hmm. themselves. So trying not to cut them off or finish those sentences for them, which I see often, especially with the elderly, like you think you know what they're going to say. So you, you say the word rather than letting them say it. So I think it's just giving them that, that extra five seconds. Like it's really not that much more, but it really would allow them the chance and the space to speak, especially when, you know, they're in an environment that's really unfamiliar to them and they don't know what's happening. So I think that's also really important. Mm -hmm. I agree. So if you could think of some one or two tangible things that we could do right now to improve how practitioners, nurses, physicians approach pain, what do you think, what, what are two tangible things that you think we could do right now to to make this a different experience for those who might be experiencing pain. So I, I, I think that the two things, the first one doesn't involve patients. The second one does. So, you know, going, going back to some of the earlier comments and maybe linking in with what, what Sarah just said, you know, we, we often don't realize that when we're talking to patients, we've kind of decided already whether or not they should have pain, not have pain, you know, and, and that links back to just, the way that we go about doing medicine, right? We, we have this working diagnosis going, going on in our head whenever we walk into any patient situation. And what we're really doing is we're testing out whether or not what we thought before we even talked to them is true and whether or not we need to change what we believe moving forward. And, and there's been some really good studies that have been going on since, you know, the, the 1980s looking at you know, this, I, I don't know if you guys ever read that book, How Doctors Think. It's a it's an older book from, I think, a couple of decades back. But they, they quote a study where they looked at the time it takes, just like you said, Sarah, for someone to interrupt a patient's uh, interview. And what they did over, over the course of the study is they really linked that to, you know, the idea that you're trying to redirect them to answer your questions of whether or not your working diagnosis is true or not. You know, it right. could be anywhere from a few seconds to you know, a few minutes. And I, I often catch myself, you know, meeting people in person for the first time, my eyes are drawn to their veins. You know, I'm, I'm looking at their neck, you know, yes. if, if they open their mouth wide when they talk, like I'm doing the Malin Patty score. I mean, oh you know, so, so, I mean, I, I've already decided within the first few seconds that I meet you, whether or not you're going to be a difficult airway or difficult. Yes, IV start. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with having that way of thinking. The, the problem is, is when that way of thinking overwhelms all other data that you get. Right. You know, where, where we really mess up in medicine is when we have a working diagnosis and regardless of the information we're getting, whether it's complete or incomplete, we decide that, hey, we're right. And sometimes it's important to do those things in that way because it's an emergency situation where you don't really have time to sit down and, you know, get additional information. But most of the time we do have time. And, you know, going going back to the the, the reporting system that, that you guys talked about earlier that that me and my brother Kamea kind of started up uh, last year, he had had an experience where he came into hospital and, you know, was really labeled as, as one diagnosis versus another. And he called me in the middle of the night and he never asks for my advice. Like, I don't know what your guys' <laughs> experience is with your siblings, but, <laughs> you know, they always ask, uh, you know, other health providers before me about, you know, what's going on. So for him to call me was like a big moment for me. But I, I'm sitting there on the phone with him in the middle of the night and he's going through describing what happened. And I'm thinking to myself, this isn't really what it sounds like, you know? And I, I started to ask him, you know, how did they gather their information? You know, history, physical labs, special investigations, imaging, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, I, I learned pretty quickly that all that had happened was him asking a few questions, the provider, you know, and, and I, I told him, you know, I, I think this is actually much more concerning. And I, I talked him through how to navigate the system towards, you know, a, a second opinion. And, and one of the things that really struck me when I talked to him was just how scared he was uh, when it came to you know, challenging the person who's providing him care. And, and he had some very real concerns because I, I had heard about it, but I guess it grounded it in a different way because it was a family member that, you know, you, you start to question someone's assessment. I mean, you can actually get worse care now, right? Right. Like for some reason, all the pain medication dries up. Suddenly no one's rotating around to check on you, you right. know? Uh, and so he was really cognizant, cognizant of that. And, you know, I, I really encouraged him and, and, you know, uh, kudos to him that he he ended up actually following through with some of my advice, got reassessed, uh, ended up going for emergency surgery that night. Wow. You know, and, and the next morning we're talking on the phone. And, I mean, he he's very successful or has been very successful in business and he's a dentist and, you know, all these other things. And, you know, he's talking to me about what had happened. And he said, you know, no matter what I've done to contribute to, you know, my community, you know, all this privilege, he's kind of wrapped around himself, you know, the, the degrees and the letters behind your name and, you know, making your, making sure that your face is out there and you're known and all these other things. He said, you know, I put on that hospital gown and I became just another Indian, you know, and, and I think that that's something that we can never underestimate within medicine that, you know, I have this idea of what you have. And as a provider, I can strip away everything else that you are and just let myself and my ideas fill that space because that's the way that medicine's set up. Wow, now, yeah. we're doing a better job of making sure that doesn't happen, but especially for racialized mm -hmm. individuals, stripping away that armor and privilege is so easy to do in today's medical system. You know, and suddenly you get labeled as that difficult patient or you know, that person who's quote unquote non-compliant, you know, one of the terms that I, I have grown to really, really dislike in medicine. Um, and, and suddenly you just, you, you can't even get care, right? you know, and I, I think that that's a really scary place to be as a patient. And, you know, it's not really something that, that crosses the average provider's mind. Even though we all, yeah, absolutely. We all that can just see actually brought back a memory I had of it, speaking to a previous guest of ours who said that she needed to actually get dressed up to go to the emergency room so that people would take her seriously and not think that she was a drug addict or homeless because of her presentation. And I feel like not everybody understands what it's like to be a racialized individual and all of the microaggressions that we experience, a lot of us on a daily basis. And, you know, I'm so glad that you came on and shared your knowledge with us. I feel like we could talk for hours. We could just do this, you know, 10 more times. Um, 
I've had so many light bulb moments already. Yeah. I'm just wondering, no, like, do you have any sort of last yet. words of wisdom for our listeners? Like anything that we haven't touched upon that you want to share with everyone? You know, there, there is one thing that I, I've come back to many times since, you know, being successful with the election back in, back in February. And that's this idea that there's all these different stories, like this overriding narrative in medicine about how things are supposed to be and the way that we're supposed to react to situations. And I, I really think that if we're going to chart a different course forward, and I think the pandemic and everything else that has gone on in the past couple of years has really shown that the status quo, like it, it just can't continue on like this. We're, we are not going to end up in a good place. We're not in a good place right now. You know, and not just, you know, racialized narratives um, related to things like Black Lives Matter and changes in culture and medicine, et cetera, but also this idea that austerity in and of itself is a positive thing, right? Like we can cut ourselves into sustainability. You know, I, I look at what's going on in Ontario and BC and Alberta and Manitoba and Saskatchewan, you know, all these places that are really struggling right now. Um, you know, we, we've cut our way to this place. Like we, we have no resiliency because we made choices that brought us here. And, you know, we, we can't double down after the pandemic's done and just continue doing the same thing. But in order to have, you know, a different path forward, I, I think we really need a different type of story. Yeah. You know, and it, it needs to be a story that, you know, puts caring for each other in the center of everything again. You know, I think one of the, the, big parts of the austerity story was, you know, people should take care of themselves and lift their own weight and all this other stuff. The, the truth is health is not a normal, uh, a normal commodity in the market. Right. You know, th there is no invisible hand when it comes to health. You know, we, we make choices on whether or not people live and die. That's, that's health, you know, and introducing competition and, you know, trying to push for the lowest possible number that you could push, you know, a nurse into who, is now working way harder than a nurse ever has before with way less support, you know, um, it's, it's unreasonable. Like we, we've just reached these very unreasonable states where, you know, it's, it's not humane anymore to put people in these positions. And I, I see those narratives starting to break through kind of the, the old things that we used to believe. And I think it's things like podcasts like this and, you know, conversations that you have, you know, at work and with patients and, you know, things that, that people write about that that's going to take us into that new narrative. And I, I really hope that over the next three to five years, we find a new story to drive medicine yeah. and things that have gone forward because the old story brought us here and here is not a good place. Yes. I, I, wow. Like I have chills down my spine because like, I think it's like you just read me. <laughs> it's just like we, <laughs> we we need to chart a completely different course. We need to move in a completely different rhythm. We can't go back to where we were. And like you said, it's it's not even just, you know, some of these movements that we're seeing, you know. I think it's it's pulled back the veil on knowing that what what we're doing is not adequate and that silence is not going to change anything. And that's why we're here today. Continue having empowering conversations, continuing to empower people with knowledge like this episode, I think is going to be fire. I'm so glad that you came on. I hope we'll have you again. And I, and I hope that there's, I, I, I don't hope, I know that there's a lot of information that people will take away from, from this conversation today to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to try to do a little bit, do something a little bit different. And I think those little changes we'll, uh, we'll start to see some bigger changes, but I think we just need to start small. And I think, um, these conversations are the way to, way to go. And we, we start, we start here, but we don't end here. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. We thank you and we appreciate you. Yeah. Thank, thanks for having me and, you know, keep on speaking up and I, I listen to your podcast. I download it, you know, and, uh, I think these conversations, I mean, that's the beginning of creating a new way forward and, I, I'm I'm always hopeful after conversations like this that you know none of us are in this alone. We just need to find each other. I, I agree. I think that I'm I'm so happy we found each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate having you here today. 